what I'm going to be talking about is stuff that's like really applicable to uh, the whole GAR project, um, not just stuff that we do at Google. So uh, after I talk, instead of questions, we'll just get all the maintainers up here and we can answer any questions you have uh, about the content in this talk or, like Luca said, uh, really any questions. Um, so let's get started. My name is Dave Borowitz. I'm a software engineer at Google, uh, currently in the Seattle office. I've been working on Garrett for a long time, uh, about seven years. I had to go back this morning and look at my uh, very first commit in history from December 2011. Um, at Google, as many of you know, we run a sort of hosted version of Garrett that's used to serve the Android Open Source Project, the Chrome Project, um, and, and a large variety of smaller teams. Uh, we uh, this talk is not about that. This is about stuff that uh, both Google contributors and non-Google contributors have added to Garrett Core in the last uh, year, year and a half, and stuff we're going to add uh, some more in the future. Um, so this is not, uh, David Persau said this morning that uh, he thought that I was just going to give the, the talk about what's new in 2.15 and it would just be a list of features. Uh, first section is, is called Out with the Old and In with the New. So uh, Garrett 2.16 and 3.0 are really about getting rid of some of Garrett's legacy features or replacing them with new and exciting things. Uh, before we actually even get started about uh, with, with the Garrett product, I wanted to show you something that some of you might not be familiar with. We recently relaunched GarrettCodeReview.com. Uh, it used to look like this. Uh, it had, this, is, this is the old website. It's got a Diffie logo. It's got some columns. Um, this has the, actually the really nice property that uh, when you submitted like a change to uh, the markdown, in the home page repository, it came up live. Um, unfortunately, there are some downsides of using this implementation. Uh, this uses like a pretty handwritten uh, markdown parser based on the common mark library, but uh, with a bunch of features on top, like these, these tables that you see in the layout weren't part of common mark. Uh, and as a result, it's like really hard to add new features to like this rendering engine. And it's also really hard to add new custom themes. So uh, this Garrett code review site looks like pretty much every other Gittles Markdown website. And we just, we wanted something a little shinier, a little more modern looking. So we got this. Uh, this is a, a new template um, using a rendering engine, rendering engine, yeah, called, called Jekyll. Um, which is written in Ruby. Uh, nice thing about Jekyll is it just it renders static HTML, so you can serve it from anywhere. Uh, it's got a big user community um, that contributes a lot of features to it. You can see, like for example, one thing in the top right of this screen is there's like a search box. This is actually some like totally client-side search, so it actually loads in all of the keywords from all of the pages in your in your JavaScript. So it's a very fast search. Uh, there's no way that I could have possibly implemented that in uh, like our Markdown renderer for Gittles. So it's stuff like that, that that made us want to move to a kind of more modern hosting platform. Um, yeah, so this is this is the uh, the thing that you probably like the most interested in. Maybe it's just the thing that gives the best screenshots. Uh, so how many of you uh, who are running Gara 215 have users who are using the Polygar UI. Oh, that is actually more hands than I expected. So this will like not be super new to you, but um, this is something that uh, everybody who's using an earlier version of Gara can look forward to. Um, these slides are from, uh, pardon me, from 2.16 RC3. And actually, literally, I was like going through and redoing all the screenshots last night. And as soon as I was done, I like opened my email and saw that Luca had uh, published 2.16 final. So this is like a little bit behind the time, but as you'll see, it actually, uh, the, the polygear look is kind of stabilized, so I feel confident like showing these screenshots so that when you use it, this will actually be the thing that you see. You may uh, remember this uh, change screen. This is using a thing that we call GWT. Um, this personally to me looks ancient because it actually we have not had the option of using this on googlesource.com for months and months, um, but most of you are probably familiar with it. Actually, there's not, this is not the worst UI in the world. Like I'm not gonna, not gonna knock the people who like this. But GWT does have its problems. Uh, we learned that like front-end developers really would not touch GWT with a 10-foot pole. Um, it, it was really hard to like actually get meaningful support from people who uh, engagement from people like UX designers because they just weren't using GWT. So we we had to we had to move to something new to modernize the look a little bit. And this is what we got. This is uh, from 2.15, which you can see from the screenshot. Um, it is sort of got all the same things, sort of moved around a little bit. There's still some rough edges in 215. For example, uh, the, the drop downs have two different styles. There's the side by side diff drop down, and then the, the path set drop down look different. And this is kind of okay. It's missing some features. Um, the recommendation in 215 is always, of course, if you can't do it in 
the Polygary UI, you just click the switch to old UI button in the bottom, you're back in GWT. In 2.16, it looks slightly different. Let's just go back and forth a couple of times, see if you can spot the differences. The biggest uh, change sort of architecturally is that we've moved to um, a material design theme. This is a set of uh, UX guidelines and components released by Google. So we're kind of getting it in line with the current best practices uh, in terms of web design uh, standards from Google. Um, we redesigned this uh, submit requirements area. So there's a little hourglass icon next to code review. We can actually show stuff in there that are not just submit or not just label names, which uh, I'll mention briefly a little bit later. Uh, the name in the top left changed from Poly Garrett to Garrett to emphasize that this is like this is not an alternative to the Garrett UI. This is the Garrett UI. There's sort of, and then we, we have a constant battle of uh, figuring out how big each of these sections should be and how much white space there should be. Another thing that uh, is new in uh, 2.16 is we have this nice update change button, which is a theme that we'll see uh, some more in the future that um, we want to really increase the level of in-product help we have so that people don't have to refer to another document to learn how to update or change. This actually just opens up a dialog that says, if you want to update your change, uh, run git commit dash dash amend and then git push. Uh, but it's useful to have as in-product help. Uh, this is the thing you've probably all been waiting for. Thank you, Casper, for uh, knocking this out at the, the hackathon in Lund. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's dark mode for Garrett now. Uh, it is still labeled as alpha. Uh, I think that there are some known issues, but uh, the, uh, the dark mode is like all the rage these days. So now, now you can use it. And Garrett 3.0, it's actually like, it's, it's pretty much identical to uh, Garrett 216. The uh, changes are a little bit more modest. There's uh, uh, some tweaks that you um, can't really see in this one screenshot, but it's more about finishing all of the features in GWT to reach feature parity so we can delete the GWT UI. And we actually deleted the GWT UI uh, yesterday. Yeah, click submit to like delete 50,000 lines of code. It's always really satisfying. Uh, there's, there's just a long tail of features. We haven't quite reached parity, but like in 3.0, we know we can't release 3.0 until we actually have parity, but there's just stuff that is features that are important for certain use cases, but not the majority, like uh, uh, plug-in provided settings pages are uh, something that requires a little bit more UI work. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's it for chain screen. We also have a, a similar progression for the dashboard, the old dashboard, the slightly newer dashboard, and the newer, newer dashboard. This is, uh, you can see that we're sort of gradually increasing the amount of white space, which is always a controversial decision, but the, the bigger picture is that we're getting rid of like the Chrome around uh, the dashboard. So like if you look at where on the screen the first uh, actual content is, that moves up and up. So even though we have more white space, give it a little more room to breathe, we're actually, uh, showing almost the same amount of content on the page, which is good. Uh, 3.0 is, again, um, yeah, pretty much identical to, to 2.16. The one thing that I want to show that's new in 3.0 is we have this uh, more in-product help. There's a little dialogue that helps you push your first change for review if you've never done that before. It opens up a dialogue. You can select a project and a branch, and then you just, like, get uh, get some instructions. So this is like not, uh, everybody in this room is an experienced Garrett user. You are not like the tar target audience for this, but um, you've probably seen customers or users get confused by this kind of thing. Uh, and it's nice that we're able to help them out a little bit more. Uh, that's it for the UI. Uh, NoteDB. So this is, I'm continuing to like copy uh, the contents from old slides. Um, this, uh, I gave this pretty much the exact same things on this slide at my talk, these are some of last year. The reasons that NoteDB is a system where we store all of the code review metadata and all the account data and group data in Git repositories instead of in a traditional SQL based database. There are a lot of reasons that we wanted to do this, mostly for consistency, I would say is like my personal number one reason is that if you can just do like an atomic update to uh, add a new patch, patch set ref and also update the database and there's no way that like they, they're, they're atomic. Either both of those things succeed or they both fail. And you can also replicate these atomically if you want to do a backup, it's just a, a, a git clone backs up all your data. We, this also uh, produces like a really nice log of actions that I'll show on the next slide. And uh, yeah, we, there's um, new features. Uh, so this was like kind of speculative when, when I talked about it last year that you could do federation and uh, inner operation with other systems. 
Um, but actually, these things are both realities now. I found out about this like about a month ago. The, the Go project, the Go programming language, has a tool called Maintainer that uh, instead of using the REST API, actually just fetches the NoteDB data and like creates a whole graph in memory of uh, all of the code review data. And like that's how it interacts with Garrett. And I didn't like come up with this on my own. Uh, this is a way that I did not guess that the system would be used, but I think that's a sign of a successful system, that it's used in novel ways. Uh, and Federation, we actually have a, a partner um, who is taking an entire copy of all the NoteDB data from one of our hosts and like running it in a separate Garrett server on premise uh, that has a bunch of extra custom plugins and workflow stuff. Um, and they did this like, they didn't have to ask us. They like uh, uh, noticed some bugs and then they filed bugs and they're like, why doesn't this NoteDB copying thing work exactly like I expected? I'm like, wow, that's a... That's a new thing that you're doing. Nobody's done that before. I hope that I hope there will be more of these in the future. Uh, this is what NoteDB looks like. It is a text-based, largely text-based format, where every um, change uh, identified here, like change number 12, has a metadata ref associated with it, and it has. Uh, it's just a commit that is by a user on this uh, server, and there's a bunch of metadata associated with the with the change. And this is a git log, so if, as we create or update the change more, there are more entries in the commit log, so you have a really clear representation of what happened to the change over time. Uh, yeah. So the big the big difference between uh, a year ago and today is that like no TB actually happened. For a while, I wasn't like sure it was going to happen, but I mean. It's it's production ready in 215. Like Google has been running this in production for well over a year. Uh, we got rid of our last vestiges of database. Uh, I think like beginning of this year, beginning of 2018. Um, as Luca mentioned, there are definitely some uh, some places where it's not as optimized as it could be, uh, particularly around the accounts database. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, yeah, it it happened. Uh, in 2.16, you can do an offline or an online migration. The online migration, like an online re-index, is going to be pretty slow. Offline migration is faster, but you uh, you take more downtime. Uh, there's in 2.16, technically, there's still a tiny, tiny little bit of data that stays in ReviewDB. But in 3.0, like I, in the heck of time this week, I was like chopping out those last bits of uh, ReviewDB dependencies, and soon I'm going to be able to delete more tens of thousands of lines of code. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, 3.0, like you're, it's not going to not going to have a database. It's not going to respect the database configuration options in your Garrett Tuck config. Uh, your database will stick around. It's not going to delete your data, but it's not going to need it anymore. So I think that's exciting. Uh, correct. In 2.16, it, it actually needs the database. There are like two tables. They're called uh, system config and schema version. Each of them has one row in them. So literally, your entire database in 3.0 or in 2.16 will be two rows and two tables. But it actually, those are like super necessary. <laughs> yeah, you can't just you can't just make those go away. Actually, the schema version is very necessary. The system config is not so much. Yes. Uh, the question was um, how to, how to, does the migration work from 2.15 to 3.0? Yeah, so um, since 3.0 will literally not be able to connect to a database, you uh, have to take either 2.15 or 2.16, which both support NoteDB and um, run the NoteDB migrator. Uh, you can do this with like minimal downtime if you upgrade from upgrade to 2.16, do an online upgrade, and then upgrade to 3.0, which will not have a data rewriting schema migration. You're just like you, you run in it and, and then relaunch the daemon. Uh, but there, yeah, so there's no, you do have to go to either 2.15 or 2.16 before 3.0. Uh, I think that 2.16 or 3.0 will be smooth. Um, there, I, just because of the way we're doing the schema migrations, there's actually, like, not a whole lot of migration. There will be a, an index upgrade, like there, there often is between versions, but uh, there, there's no data migration. It will all, uh, you, you have to run a command that migrates your data in 2.16, or pass a flag to the daemon when you start up to say automatically migrate my data. So it's like, it's a teeny tiny bit more than zero work, but 2.16 or 3.0, you should just be able to run in it and launch the daemon. We've had a rough time with Prolog. Uh, is there anybody in here who like, like literally enjoys writing Prolog submit rules? Not just like you know how to do it or like you feel confident or you've acquired this, this skill, but like do you enjoy it? 
Uh, yeah, so um, I can look at this submit rule and sort of muddle my way through it. There's something about counting the number of unresolved comments, and uh, if uh, the, co the number is greater than zero, then you, like, need this label. Again, sort of figure that out from looking at this. I don't know what this exclamation point means. Um, and if you, like, asked me to write this from scratch without referring to documentation, I would be like, I, I, I couldn't. I might be able to do it if I had documentation and could spend a day on it. And this is like a thing out of, the, out of the cookbook. You can copy and paste this, but if you want to do anything more complicated, you're kind of on your own. Uh, well, uh, thanks to the really hard work of a, a very talented intern we had in the Google Munich office, you can now write uh, submit rules in Java. So this is like slightly more code than, than the previous slide. You know, it's Java, it's kind of verbose. But I think in, it's like really pretty super readable here. Uh, you count the number of unresolved comments in your change, and if the number is greater than zero, you say the status is not ready. Um, there's some other, there's this other thing I'll call the submit requirement, which Hanwen will talk a little more about. Um, but this is like a new feature, and even including this new feature, it still fits on one slide. Uh, and this is this is in 2.16. You uh, you can write these uh, submit rules in Java. The downside, of course, is that this is uh, Java. It is a plugin, so you have to actually like compile code and drop in your plugins directory in order to deploy it. You can't just push it in a rules.pl file. Uh, we, it, that that is a downside, but uh, we haven't yet gotten rid of Prolog. So if you don't like that, you can stick with Prolog. Yeah. So that is a uh, uh, the the comment was about. Um, having a Java plugin that lets you drop in JavaScript files, and that is um, not so far from the truth. Uh, now we'll talk about a topic that doesn't sound interesting at all, but actually I think this is one of the coolest parts of this presentation. Uh, this is all based on work that Edwin uh, Kempen did, who's not here, a uh, longtime Garrett contributor and Google employee who you may know. This is actually kind of exciting from a, from a programming perspective, uh, that we got to replace like a, a API that I always found difficult to use. Um, the SLF4J logging API. Now we have this new logging API that is called Flogger. So it's, it is short for Fluent Logger. Um, instead of like trying to guess what this, what the order of arguments are and concatenating strings yourself, you just do this uh, nice little fluent thing, and it has really good performance when logging is not enabled. But really, this is not the exciting part about logging. Uh, the, what's really exciting is the, the new features that we get from this. The number one thing that I want to talk about is request tracing. So you might have a user who files a bug, bug number 123, and they complain that uh, the auto reviewer suggestion thing is too slow, and you don't want to figure out why that is. Uh, so right now, the logs, unless you configured your logs to have like really, like, log at the finest level for everything, and then you're generating gigabytes of logs a day, you can't really figure this out. But uh, there's this really handy feature that you can just pass a single request parameter, uh, trace, and you give it the bug number. This is just any any string you want. Uh, and this is a string that will show up in your logs. It will, uh, when processing a request with tracing enabled, it will automatically enable the maximum level of debug logging just for that request. So there's a single request that shows up in your log. Um, this is a sample from uh, actual live code when I ran this request that uh, you can see that doing a query took 10 milliseconds and it has this uh, thing that uh, Flogger calls a logging context. So there are strings you associate with the logging context. It has trace ID bug 123, so you can search for that in your logs. Everything with that trace ID is related to this request, and only the things that are related to this request or to manually trace requests actually show up in your logs. So this is actually a tiny, tiny fraction of what you get when you... Uh, enable tracing for this one request. Yeah, it's actually like 200 lines of, of stuff. It's almost like we have, we, we have uh, every time a plugin is invoked, how long we spent doing plugin stuff, uh, every time it records a metric that shows up in your monitoring, it records that, so that's what these uh, uh, metrics.timer0 things are. Every time it has a query to the index, all sorts of stuff just gets logged, which is great. Uh, it's actually possible we have too much logging, but um, that's like kind of a good problem to have. We can we sort of err on the side of giving people more information, and we can always undo those logging statements. And the best part is, uh, you probably missed this. There's actually nothing you have to do when writing code in Garrett to turn on this tracing stuff. Like you literally, there's nothing in this log that says base reviewer scores that says if tracing is enabled, also append this other stuff to the log entry, or only do this if tracing is enabled. That is all provided for us for free by the. Um, Flogger machinery, which I think is cool. Yeah, so thank you, Edwin. He also did a lot of, uh, Flogger is like a kind of new Google project, and he did a lot of work to add features to it that Garrett would need and get it, help them get it ready for open sourcing. Uh, so we're we're happy to be, we are happy converts to Flogger. We're, we used to have this uh, system for 
writing email templates called VTL, Velocity Templating Language. It's a, it's a not very widely used system. Um, it's another language that is sort of difficult to learn, and we uh, have to ask our administrators to learn that, like we ask them to learn Prolog. Uh, and our security team was actually not really happy with the level of XSS pr protection this provides for writing HTML emails. So we replaced it with one that is written by Google, uh, so we know our security team likes it. It's called Soy. Uh, it is another thing that you have to learn, but uh, it is, in my opinion, a less complex language than VTL. What's new here is uh, it's been deprecated since 2.14. In 2.16, actually, it's gone. So if you have any VTL templates left, you have to convert them. Sorry. Uh, the project index. So um, when upgrading 2.16, you do have to take an additional step to create a new project index. Uh, why is this a thing that you want? Is anybody familiar with this screen where you, uh, I guess this is Polygear, so maybe you're not. Uh, you open the project list and you are presented with a loading icon and that lasts there for maybe a minute or something. Um, in Garrett 216, you actually will get results back quickly because they are served from a secondary index. So you can do a search. Uh, I think this filter doesn't quite support like a full query language, but that's just, uh, we could, we haven't done it yet. But this page will load basically instantaneously, uh, even if your project cache size is not the same as the number of projects. So you can actually size your project cache to the number of projects that are actually used instead of your total number of projects. Um, as a slight aside, uh, the project cache I'm aware uses a ton of memory and I would like that to not be the case. Uh, it, it's a long story and will require many thousands of lines of refactoring. Um, but because of this project index work, you can actually now not have quite a large, quite as large a project cache. So that's cool. These are mostly my viewpoints. Um, they're, uh, I, you know, I, I work with people like Google who also share these viewpoints. Um, I don't claim to have convinced everybody in the community or the maintainers that everything I'm going to say is a good idea. I'm excited about having faster development of new features. Uh, this is comes from the, the large amount of work that I've done on NoteDB over the years. But actually, as I mentioned earlier, we are like this close to being able to delete ReviewDB code. And we've actually been holding ourselves back from developing big new features that have to do with like adding new fields to changes or maybe new top level entities because like we didn't want, we, right now we still have to support both ReviewDB and NoteDB in the code and we didn't want to like implement a feature twice and then delete it next month or delete half of that code next month. So uh, when we start deleting ReviewDB, it, uh, it'll get easier. I think uh, another big theme that I uh, like to hit on and uh, Hanwen will also talk about is that actually a lot of my team's time, we are software engineers, we like to be writing code, but all we do is spend doing a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is actually user support. We've got to triage bugs, we have to like figure out what is wrong with people's prolog rules and um, we want to get more users within Google and outside of Google, but we cannot scale our support in a, with the way that some of uh, Garrett's current systems are working. So we want, basically, I want to figure out like what features are causing the most support burden and just like provide simpler alternatives that still meet the needs of our customers, but um, don't re uh, require so much support from an engineering team. The biggest example, of course, Prolog, uh, the thing that everybody, especially me, loves to hate. Um, yeah, uh, we actually had an outage yesterday uh, it, for googlesource.com for our internal Android review server where it, it became totally unusable because we like exceeded this internal database size that's controlled by the rules.maxprolog database size configuration. It turns out that when you, uh, when you, your rules get too complicated, just everything throws 500. We found this out the hard way. So this is an example of the support burden that I'd like to lighten. I think there's a question back there. Uh, we were not the first people to have this problem. I'm actually not surprised to hear that because this like configuration option actually exists. <laughs> it wouldn't exist if, if the default were good enough for everybody. Um, permission backends, yeah. So this is like kind of a, a bunch of refactoring that we've been doing um, over the last really year or two. Uh, a lot of the support stuff that we have to deal with is people who are having a hard time configuring their ACLs. And there's really, it's, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but it, it feels like there's not really a way to dig ourselves out of this hole to like really like take the, the ACL system and like make it simpler so that we don't have to have so many support problems. So what we've actually done is like some, uh, uh, kind of take the easy way out and sort of abstract out the, the permission back the permission layer so that we can install an alter alternative permission backend um, that might look something more like uh, role-based access control. Uh, some, some simpler 
access model that's still compatible with Garrett, and you can we can just sort of say, if you are in the 90% of customers who only use 10% of the features of the ACL system, why don't we just give you a simpler ACL system? And this is how we're doing it. Uh, so right now, where, where we are is uh, we have factored out this interface, and there is one implementation, and it supports the old uh, ACL system. But uh, I'm really interested to see uh, where, where people go with this in the future. Uh, more backend stuff, account backends. Um, Luca mentioned that uh, the the way that we do accounts in uh, NoDB has some has some performance problems. But like you, if you just take a step step back, uh, like why do we even need the Garrett account system? Um, so just like what if instead of having a Garrett accounts table, like we just everybody on your LDAP server automatically had an LDAP account. Like, you, Garrett can already inter interface with LDAP for groups. Like, why can't it just do that for accounts also? We would like that to happen. Um, say, similar, uh, one of the reasons we have accounts is that there are user preferences that are specific to Garrett, you know, like the number of lines of context in your diff view. But the LDAP, I think, provides enough storage that you could just store that as an attribute on your LDAP account entity. Uh, so we want to basically take the same trick that we did for permission backends and apply it to accounts. Actually, the problem with account has nothing to do with accounts. It's because when you put a comment on a change, you know where it goes? The account. So whenever, it's not if you change your account settings, but whenever you post something that is in draft mode, it's going through the accounts. Yeah, but because because we share this like one location for account settings and uh, draft comments, uh, when we cause the repository to become slow for draft comments, it also makes normal account interactions slower than they need to be. Uh, and this actually, I think, has the potential to solve our like our probably our actual number one user complaint, um, which is not it's not prolog, it's not ACLs, it's like I want to add my coworker as a reviewer, but they don't have an account yet. So uh, if it just you just automatically had an account for everybody in your LDAP syst system, or I mean for Google, it would be if they have a Google account and that Google account can see this change, you can just add them. No more accounts. I think that would be uh, exciting. Yeah, you could also uh, we could also like use this to to share preferences between different servers. I know a lot of you have will have like a single centralized uh, LDAP server for your organization, but you have might have multiple small Garrett servers. So having an idea that like the user deborowitz is the same because it corresponds to the same LDAP account. You get the same preferences on all 10 of the Garrett servers that your organization runs. I think that'd be pretty cool. CI integration. This is like something that we hear about all the time. Um, there are as many different methods of integrating with CI systems for Garrett as there are people in this room. Um, we know that our customers really love creating new uh, custom labels to represent different uh, stages in their CI pipeline. Uh, our largest customer, I think, has like like dozens, like more than three dozen different custom labels. And uh, the UI doesn't really scale to having three custom labels. Even in the Polygare UI, if you remember, there's just like a little little square in the corner of the screen that is like all your labels have to go here. So you have 30 of them, and maybe some of them ha are like names that are 10 words long. It's really hard to make a UI that where that actually makes makes sense. But if you again, if you take a step back, the real problem here is that we don't provide any better way of interfacing with the CI system. What we really want is something to, to have display build results in a structured way um, and uh, have something, a way to block submission of a change that is not necessarily just a label, which ties into the, the new submit requirements feature that Hanlon will talk about tomorrow. Uh, I really think we can do better. And I mean, I, I'm not going to take credit for this idea. Like David Ostrowski per, per, presented a uh, proposal for this like four years ago about how to do this. Um, one of the reasons that we resisted doing it back then was uh, the thing that I mentioned before that we would have had to implement it in both NoteDB and ReviewDB and I didn't want to do that. Well, now we're getting rid of NoteDB and ReviewDB so it's uh, a good time to start revisiting some of these um, sort of big ideas that, uh, that we had pushed back on before. Um, on the UI side, uh, Polymer 3 is the thing. So we're on like Polymer is is has major versions like anything else. We're on Polymer version one, which goes away next year. Uh, like the, the code's not going to get deleted from, you know, uh, NPM or whatever, but uh, the team is going to stop supporting it. Um, Polymer two and three, we have to migrate to. There's a thing after that. The Polymer team actually kind of, I'm going to probably going to say a wrong thing because uh, I haven't uh, talked to the team about this, but you can ask Casper or Thomas. Uh, the new hot thing recommended by the Polymer team is called Lit Element. It is like Polymer, but not Polymer. 
Um, or maybe we should just be using like some other framework. I don't know. They're like uh, the the point I want to make here is that the UI work is not done. This is sort of like the the JavaScript framework treadmill that there's always something new, and uh, you can sort I can sort of say well do we regret the decision of using Polymer if we're gonna have to migrate off of it in, in another couple of years? I don't. I don't think if I uh, if you ask me to pick a new JavaScript framework today that is going to meet all of our needs and we're sure is going to be around in three years, I don't think I could do better than rolling dice. Uh, I, it's uh, there's there's always a cost to staying up to date with the latest frameworks, um, and that's the thing that we're going to have to do. But the the nice thing is that compared to the uh, GWT to Polymer migration, like that was hard because we literally couldn't reuse any code. We had like a bunch of Java code, and we had to rewrite it all in JavaScript. I think there is some hope that even if we uh, Casper's nodding his head, so I know I'm not saying a wrong thing. There's some hope that if we uh, even if we migrate to something like totally different. Uh, like React, that uh, we would actually be able to reuse some JavaScript code. <laughs> we have some documentation, but our documentation is not good enough. We want more in-product help. Um, getting people to sort of really deeply understand why you need change IDs, how to manipulate them, how to do an interactive rebase to, to modify multiple changes in a series is something that feels like second nature to me. I've been working on Garrett for a long time. It may There may be people in this room who it feels like second nature to. There may also be people in this room who get constantly confused by this and would like more assistance, more, more assistance from the Git core tools or at least like tutorials from Garrett. This is something we would like to focus on. Uh, you can sort of you can tell that, uh, I always like to say, you can tell that we, Garrett has written, or the Garrett documentation is written by developers because by far the best section of our documentation is the REST API documentation. But like, but like, like the people reading the docs are like, they they don't care about that in the slightest. They're using a UI. What they care about is how do I come to this product I've never used for the first time and actually use it in a meaningful way. And so that is something we want to address. Uh, and I'll I'll end this presentation on something that might be a little bit controversial. I put a question mark to indicate that it's controversial. Uh, Garrett has always been strongly opinionated that. Each commit that gets reviewed should be reviewed as a unit. It should be a completed thought. Test should pass. Um, but this is uh, this is not the only philosophy out there. I don't want to give up that philosophy. I think it's part of what makes Garrett Garrett. But even within this framework of uh, creating commits that are bisectable and that pass all on CI, sometimes it makes sense to be able to review multiple commits as a single unit. You want to you have a series that comprises five changes. You might want to diff the tip of that series against the base. Uh, and right now you can't do this in Garrett. There's like there's literally no screen that is that is viewing something other than a change. Uh, you can sort of do it today if that commit if the tip commit is actually a merge commit, you can compare the side branch versus the uh, the mainline branch. But working with I mean I just uh, tried to make the point that working with series and interactive rebases and change IDs is kind of a pain. It's a pain when it's a linear series. It's like twice as much of a pain or maybe impossible when you have a bunch of merge commits. So this is like not a really satisfying solution. Uh, I I think that we can address some of these uh, these needs that people have and have something that is not pull requests but solves uh, that but allows us to review more than one change as a single unit. Um, and the challenge, I think, will be uh, achieving that while also keeping the essential features of Garrett for people who really are used to Garrett or, or buy into the philosophy. So I, I didn't mean to, that sort of sounded like it's not kind of a, a downer note. I'm actually really excited about all the things that we are uh, going to have the opportunity to do in the next couple years. Um, and thank you for listening to me ramble. <laughs>